social and eusocial creatures. It's not just about making some offspring living together temporarily. There are other possibilities for the social organism. To find social, eusocial, kin selection, inclusive fitness, altruism, and haplodiploidy. Differentiate between social and eusocial creatures. We're going to focus primarily on wasps. Calculate indirect fitness. Calculate kin selection in terms of Hamilton's law, well, rule. And define and explain altruism. So, social. Makes sense. Social network. Social living. Socialism. We are social. It's easy to grasp. This is, this is something that makes sense. It's driven by needs of the defense of mates, defense of youngs. I mean, if you doubt that we are, you know, creatures that care for our mates, our youngs, and our community, just watch some political ads uh, about um, they're coming for your suburbs and they're going to destroy your family and your friends. You know, it puts a fright in us because we're social creatures. We like our family and our friends. We like things that keep them alive. Um, it's a group kind of living. We, uh, we tend to hang out together. As you see, all these people hanging out, you know, not a cell phone in sight. That's disappointing. Also, it's interesting because as social creatures, there are physiological and biochemical changes for rejection, for alienation. Now, this is actually a really fun and weird one, is that at some point, you're going to write an essay, and I'm going to be grading it. Uh, it might be a results section or something. I'm going to send back comments, and to me, these comments are just about the writing and the writing process and how to improve yourself, and to me, quite a bit of yawn. But when you read these comments, especially if I use the pronoun you or the pronoun I in the comments, you will actually feel a pain in the pit of your stomach. So it's actually a physiological hurt that you will actually register as pain. You may say that Dr. Bodhi's comments hurt me. Now here's the deal. I'm working on how to work with you on writing, but why does that actually cause a physical pain to feel um, that I believe your writing is insufficient? Because you are afraid of rejection by another member of the same species. But let's, let's really face the facts. You don't care what I think of you. I mean, I think you're bright if I'm editing your paper. If I didn't think you were bright, I wouldn't spend the time and waste the effort of editing a paper. So it's actually a compliment the more I make comments. Just remember to swap that one out because the initial thing is always this physiological and biochemical change. If someone says something negative to you or about you, it actually physically hurts. I'm saying it about the paper, not about you. I, I value you, dear watcher, who I can't physically see. <laughs> we are social creatures. There can be you social creatures too, and this exists along a gradient. The lion pride is a social group. You see the two males here, think them as brothers, and you see a few females here, uh, think of them as sisters. This is a, um, what type of uh, mating system? I hope you said polygyandry, because that would be correct. It's a polygyandrous system. Now, the males may leave, the females may leave, and if they leave, they can live alone. It's going to be very difficult to raise cubs alone, but they can. Um, that's a little more social. I should have started with it. the cats here. The cats are actually less social. This is a cat colony. Clockwise, right? Cat colony. And the cat colony here... Um, they, they live together, but if any cat leaves, they, they can. And they generally just kind of hang out in the same area, but they're not really that much more social. They cuddle for warmth. That's great. Okay, they're social. Lions, more social. Prairie dogs, even more social, because they are going to be uh, living together, staying in, the, staying in the colony for most or all of their lives, and really... Um, some will have different roles in the colony and things that they do primarily. They can switch roles, though. If they leave the colony, they're probably going to die. But some of them will be forced out and will eventually try to find other colonies to live in. Um, then you have naked mole rats. And they are actually a eusocial mammal. 
So they have castes, they have greater than one generation living together, and they have the cooperative care of the young. So these are some things that define the difference between social and eusocial, somewhere between a colony of cats and a colony of mole rats, naked mole rats. So what is this? What does it mean to be eusocial? Well, first off, social, it's a family or a colony. You have cooperation, you have resource sharing, and it can be very loosely organized. Let's go back. The cats, they have, uh, they have a colony of cats. That's what the actual term is. There is minimal cooperation in a colony of cats. Absolutely minimal. Whereas a pride of lions will have cooperation in bringing down a kill. Is there more than one generation living together in a colony of cats? Yes. There are probably grandparent cats all the way down to kittens, but that's also because their life cycle is very short. And cooperative care of young? No, each cat is caring for its own young. Lions, cats can't, the lions can care for each other's young to an extent, mostly defense. And the cats are incredibly loosely organized. I mean, they, they, they can't organize for anything. Lions are somewhat more organized. And the prairie dogs go further along the spectrum of social, but only the mole rats are eusocial. Their nests are hives there. Um, there's also, there's more than one generation living together. That's necessary for eusociality. Cooperative care of young. Cooperative care. So the cooperative is necessary. That these mole rats may not be caring for their own offspring. They may be caring for their sisters or their sister's offspring much more often. And then the uh, division into sterile castes. So some of these mole rats will simply never have an offspring. Now we're going to take that to, um, to another extent here. We're going to look at some wasps out in the garden. Both uh, we'll see bumblebees, we'll see some butterflies for fun, and then we'll see some wasps, and we'll see the difference between um, how we go from sociality to eusociality. It's lavender flowering season here in my garden, and I've got a lot of friends. So you may see behind me the occasional swarming and movement of a whole bunch of bees. This lavender is whole, is a food source for a lot of the local bumblebees, mainly Bombus vusnesensky, which is the yellow-faced bee. Um, you can see them on the back. Since it provides nectar, it's a source for both male and female bees. The male bees will drink the nectar and just kind of enjoy it. Uh, the female bees will drink the nectar, bring it back to their hive, which is located, I haven't found it and I don't quite care to, somewhere around here. And they'll bring it back and actually regurgitate the sugars to the developing larvae. Now, also around here, there are butterflies. Now, butterflies are not eusocial creatures, not even really social creatures. They just take the nectar for their own good. Now, also here, near the lavender, are my carrots. I don't want to get too close to there because it's not the bumblebees that like the carrots. It's yellow jackets. Now the bumblebees have male and female bumblebees wandering around and the female bumblebees will bring things back to their um, back to their hive. The yellow jackets, it's all for the hive here. Those are all female and they are relentlessly relentless in their sacrifices to the hive. If a female bumblebee here, um, if she were to live alone, she could uh, she could develop if, if she were Left at a young age, she could develop into a queen bee. One of these yellow jackets has uh, virtually no chance of becoming the queen bee because these are much more eusocial. Now, both bumblebees and yellow jackets are in the wasp family. And you may not be surprised to know that bees, the honeybees, which are um, somewhere around here, are also in that same family. And they are uh, just as eusocial as the female yellow jackets here. So we have some different degrees of sociality, asociality, the butterflies that are flitting about, and uh, eusociality here pollinating my garden. So as you saw, 
the the bumblebees, they're going to live together. There is more than one generation living together. In fact, with Bambus Vosnesensky, there is a queen, and then there are a bunch of females that are younger, and these younger females are actually going to um, be taking care of the next generation of young, but they're all really coming from that one mother. So really, they're, they're taking care of their uh, subsequent sisters, and they're, they're all cooperating in taking care of those sisters, but technically, technically, none of them are sterile. They're just very, very inhibited. Now, the wasps, there are sterile casts among the wasps. So when you think of the bees, there are sterile casts among the bees, too. So these are true eusocial organisms. And that means not everyone's going to be breeding. Okay, so what's the benefit here? There are a lot of wasps that I have in my backyard. Too many wasps but none of them are going to be breeding. How does a female wasp increase her fitness? Because an organism that does not increase their fitness is the joke of evolution. It's the, it's the you don't want to be this. It's, it's not the goal. The goal is to increase your fitness. So how does a non-breeder increase the fitness? And if they don't, then there's just natural selection against it. Now, inclusive fitness is not just when you, um, when you hang out together and do leg day and try to include all the muscles and all the people. No, inclusive fitness is investing resources in your relatives. So it's known as kin selection. And there's a saying that, you know, I would die for my brother or two cousins or three cousins one time removed. I don't know the precise numbers. There's a Haldane, I think, said that. But it's the idea that you would die for someone if they're closely related. But if someone is really not closely related, then, then no, you, you definitely wouldn't. And this is the idea of kin selection, that those relatives who are most close to you share most genes with you. Your mother shares 50% of your genes. Your child shares 50% of your genes. Your twin, your uh, monozygotic twin um, clone, really, shares 100% of your genes. Now, your, um, your cousin shares 25% of your genes. And the further you go away, the less share of genes they're going to share. So this is kin selection. How much of your genes does each kin member have? And if we can calculate the relatedness, we're going to come up with a co it's something called uh, RG here. It's the percentage genetic relatedness. Then you have how much is there a benefit? And that's a benefit in terms of reproduction. And the reproduction benefit to the recipient. So there is a cousin and there is a benefit to that cousin. And you see it written as R, G, B, minus C, E greater than zero. You could also write it down like this. R, G, B must be greater than C. So the cost to me must be less than the benefit times the relatedness. So me helping a stranger. Let's say I, there is a perfect stranger. Genetic relatedness of zero. That doesn't actually happen because all humans are related, but... Genetic relatedness so close to zero as it doesn't matter. And I do something that is absolutely beneficial to them. Well, that RGB is going to be zero because you're multiplying it by a genetically relatedness of zero. If I can do something that does not cost me much, but is very beneficial to another, then that's going to work well. So feeding your young is a huge benefit to a recipient because without being fed, they are dead and dead organisms don't reproduce. That's 50% for them. And then the cost to you is probably not too much. I mean, a few thousand dinners, um, it adds up. So if I were to give my, um, if I were to take a chicken leg, which we're having chicken legs, it's our drumsticks tonight. And my son says, I want that chicken leg, that drumstick. And I, I say, okay, the reproductive cost to me is, is really zero. I mean, I'm not going to have lower fitness by giving up 
a chicken drumstick. My son, however, will turn that chicken drumstick into protein. And that guy, the older son, grew an inch last month. So the more he grows, the more attractive he will be to females eventually. So the reproductive benefit of that chicken drumstick to him is actually pretty good. Genetic relatedness is 0.5, so he's half of my genes. And uh, so really absolutely minimal to zero reproductive cost to me, benefit to him, times relatedness. It is good for me to give him my drumstick. Well, I kind of want at least one. They're, they're really tasty. But that's the idea of inclusive fitness is you look at your relatives and how much would you help them and how much does it cost you? Now, you can get into this a lot deeper, too. And we have another class for that. But let's think of some bird examples. So a bird feeds her offspring when she could be feeding herself. That's a chicken drumstick example, but it's a bird instead of a human eating a bird. So we've done that. Let's say a bird has no offspring chooses to not have a brood that um, season. She feeds the brood that her mother is raising, raising, even though she could be feeding herself. Now, if her mother is raising a brood, but she is not, and she could be feeding herself. So let's say that she's not losing out of the brood. She, maybe she didn't attract a male. Um, could feed herself, feeds her sisters and brothers. That's actually going to be a benefit there. Okay, good. A chick shoves his sibling out of the nest. Why does that happen? Well, for the chick, they are feeding themselves. So the cost, the benefit to themselves is great. Um, but the cost, the benefit to the, uh, to the other is actually you, you kill your relative. But if you're going to live or both could live at a lower fitness, sometimes benefit better to just, you know, siblicide. And that can be beneficial if only one of them was going to live if one shoves out, or neither of them may live if they both have to be fed. And this can be a real tough call there. Uh, let's say a male abandons the nest when he finds a female cheating. This is an interesting one. So if he abandons the nest, those offspring will die. They're not his offspring. So the relatedness coefficient is zero. So if the male abandons the nest, then he does not lose any fitness. So not all health must result in direct increases in offspring. So give some examples. Think of some examples of um, ways one could help another that doesn't just make babies, make babies. Think about how one could help something trap mates. How so one could help someone avoid predators. There's a lot to be thought of here. And it's all pretty good stuff. So here's uh, some examples, of, some more examples of green wood hoopoos. I love these guys. Your, your book goes into this in greater detail, so you can always skip ahead if you want to just read really intensely. Anyway, the lifetime reproduction of, uh, of success, success here, of like how many fledglings do they produce? Okay, if the males leave the nest early and start reproducing at age one, they have the highest number of lifetime babies. The males that delay reproduction have lower lifetime fitness. The females that delay reproduction actually get higher lifetime fitness. So the females will, de de will demonstrate philopatry, the love of place. The offspring are actually going to stay in the area after leaving the nest. So the females stay around for a few years. If the females wait until they are five years old to begin reproduction, they actually will end up having a higher lifetime reproductive success, more practice at um, dealing with off dealing with baby chicks. I mean, that's, that's maybe part of it, but they're also increasing their inclusive fitness. So this is one reason that wood hoopoos, the females stick around the nest, the males leave. Lions and lion coalitions. Okay, what's stronger than one lion, two lion? What's stronger than two lion, three lion? What's stronger than four? Why don't we get armies of, uh, of male lions roaming about, you know, hey, take over all the prides, yeah. No, it kind of maxes out really around three. And most of them are going to be one or two. Part of it is resources. But a coalition of two males, the proportion of the young sire, the one, the, the biggest lion will have about 66%, and the second biggest lion will have about 33% of, um, of the offspring. That's good. So if they're genetically related, 
then that's good. If they're genetically unrelated, it's still fine. That's the second graph here. It's still fine to pair up with another line because you'll still get fitness even if you are not related. Okay. So three males, though. Well, if three males are together, the third male may not get much lying around the lionesses, uh, may not have many cubs. So in this case, it's better to be related. So you see the percentage of males with unrelated partners is closer to 25% than 66%. And that's because uh, it's if you're going to be in a coalition of three lions, male lions, then uh, you better be related to those other two or none of your genes are getting passed on. Now you get four males, the third and fourth one is rarely sire cubs. Um, yeah, so any coalition larger than two or three, they better be very closely related. And even at the point where they are getting closely related, it's a real question of, okay, so those first two are producing a lot, but you better be brothers or you're not getting much of your genes passed on. It may be better to form a coalition and move along. Uh, and that's really an optimality thing. Is it better to form a coalition of four to nine um, male lions or to just be with another unrelated lion? It's optimality. What's going to be the best to pass your genes to the next generation? All right. So that's some social groups. Let's look at some use social groups. And this is fun because it's, it's, it's evolved more than once. Leaf cutter ants are one example of it evolving. Bees are another example of it evolving. Wasps and bees are related to each other. So there are different examples of it evolving. Um, that probably Vespidiae could be considered as, you know, one group. Um, but yeah, the ants and also your naked mole rats and mammals. Um, now don't confuse you sociality with like the hive mind, you know, we are bored. Be it prayer to be assimilated. Resistance is futile. That kind of thing. No, no, no. Hive minds, a Zerg mind. No, this is not, that's not you sociality. That's sharing a brain. And there's not really evidence that bees are, you know, sharing a brain. Or <laughs> the first couple that get trapped in my little uh, wasp traps would probably warn the others. Anyway, leaf cutter ants. So we have that caste system. So there are here, here you see some leaf cutter ants that are moving leaves. Okay, their job is go out, get leaves, bring leaves back. Now, as they're bringing the leaf back, they can't protect themselves from parasitic wasps. So there's another cast that rides the leaves. Now, this is a good cast to be in. They ride the leaves and they fight off any wasps that try to attack the leaf cutter ants carrying the leaves. There are leaf cutter ants that guard the nest. There are leaf cutter ants that tend the fungus. There are leaf cutter ants that do nothing but lay eggs all day. And there are leaf cutter ants with a very brief lifespan who just mate. Yeah. So these are different casts. All act to benefit the hive. Every action that benefits the hive increases the indirect fitness of the individual. That ant, which does nothing but ride leaves all day and fight off wasps, has fitness because it helps the leaf cutter ant bring the leaf back to the colony where the um, fungus tender ant will tend the fungus that grows on that. And then one of the feeder ants is going to take the fungus and feed it to the larvae that are laid by the queen. So there's a couple casts in between there. And that's the idea of a more complex system and division of work that is found in a eusocial group creature. Naked mole rats. So one reproductive queen, a few reproductive males, and the rest of the colony is not, <coughs> not doing it. Uh, the queen's very active, she's very aggressive, and by being very active and aggressive, she suppresses the reproductive drive of the other females. So here's some uh, the examples of casts here, naked mole rats, the queen, her activity, she reproduces, and Instagram photos, I don't know. Um, the small non-breeders are going to be excavating, they're going to be building the nest, doing a little foraging, finding roots. These, these chumps can chew through concrete, okay? So these, these are some pretty powerful little things. And then the large non-breeders are nest defense against snakes and against other mole rats, and their job is to bite other mole rats. So, but they're kind of similar. So with ants, you can look at their head size, and you can determine what they do based on their head size. For the mole rats, uh, it's their 
It's their head size and their body size. Really. So the division of labor exists in both of these into some non-reproductive castes. Non-reproductive castes being a real distinct thing for the eusocial creature. So how do we really, what, what are some ways to divide this? Well, there's, also, there's something called haplodiploidy. The males are haploid, the females are diploid. Okay, so that means a male drone and a female queen mate. And now the workers are 75% related to one another because they have the whole male genome and half the female genome. Okay, close relatedness, that's good. That's good for inclusive fitness. Now, any action taken by a um, any action taken by a yellow jacket worker to protect another yellow jacket worker, there's a high RG. So, if the C isn't too big but the B is great, this is this is a workable thing. Now, a worker that mates with another male donates half of her genome. When she donates half of her genome, that means she's 50% related to her own offspring. She's 50% related to her own offspring, which means under the haplodiploidy theory, the workers are more related to each other than they would be to their own kid. So there's a less of a gain by having your own offspring than from protecting your sisters. And this is true for the hymenoptera, which is the ants bees, and wasps. Not totally for some others, like mole rats. They're just really, really inbred. <laughs> Closed colonies, severe inbreeding. Hey, they're closely related. Hashtag Lannisters. So how does the queen keep her subjects in line? So here we have some, uh, these are some bees right there, some bumblebees. And um, let's say the queen dies which is probably happening as I'm filming this, actually. Some of these uh, queens are probably getting pretty old. And you can, occasionally I'll find one in the garden, and she'll be, uh, she's larger. The queens are much larger. You recognize them. And her wings are tattered, and she's just, she's just done. And you know what? It's August. It's good. It's fine. Um, she dies. Well, what happens is these bees, these bumblebees, uh, they secrete a hormone when they're present, and a pheromone when they're present. And this pheromone actually suppresses the reproductive drive of the other bees in that colony, the other bumblebees. So she's gone, and the reproductive pheromone starts going away. Now these other bumblebees that are in there, they, um, they're no longer reproductively su um, suppressed. And, well, they want to go get some offspring of their own. So they do. They leave the nest. Now, that may mean the abandonment of some of their sisters who are still larvae. And on that lavender plant, there were male bees. I recognize the difference between the males and the female, but there were male bees there. And some of those male bees are going to be finding those female bees just right, right there. So they can go become a queen. And here's the deal. This is, this is late summer. It's expected that some of, those, some of those bees are no longer being reproductively smothered. They'll leave and they'll grow and they'll become a queen, they'll mate, and then they'll go sleep for the winter. And then next spring, those queens will start their own hive, and then they will reproductively suppress the, um, the, the young. If the colony gets too big, then the reproductive suppression of these bumblebees, of their offspring, uh, just can't occur. There's just too many, too many bees and too few pheromones, and some of these are just going to kind of sneak out and leave. Uh, there's also a possibility that a queen can... Uh, give rise to a new queen, and she can leave the colony in a somewhat more peaceful manner, or the queens can fight each other and kill each other. It really depends on the species. Or if it's a yellow jacket nest, I find it and light it on fire because I hate yellow jackets. All right. So, ah, oh no, that's behind the picture. Oh no, go to the PowerPoint and uh, download the PowerPoint and just click and drag that, and you'll be able to see what I just said. That <laughs> too far into the filming. All right. I'm going to say cut and start all over again. All right. Altruism. Altruism is 
benefiting another at one's own expense. So there is an expense incurred and the benefit is for someone else. So um, an altruistic act would be, uh, so I go down to the food bank and I'm going to, um, I'm going to make sandwiches. Now that benefits another at one's own expense. Now I'm going to be perfectly honest. It's not a pure altruism act because when I make sandwiches for the homeless, I increase my own sandwich making skill. So it's not completely altruistic. So you do get some benefit from there. So, uh, but I don't even know who it benefits. So there's no, there's no RGB here. There's no relatedness. Uh, there is benefit a sandwich. Um, there's no relatedness. I have no idea who's getting these. I just know that no one in my family is going to be getting a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for them. So benefiting another at one's own expense is the idea of altruism. The, the example is always given of pushing someone out of the way of a bus and then getting run over by your, the bus yourself. Well, you know, you can do small acts of altruism too. But let's say there's a gene for altruism. So there's a gene and one allele causes the bearer of that gene to be altruistic. The other allele doesn't. So that's, this is a theory called the Greenbeard hypothesis. The Greenbeard hypothesis would say it was Dawkins. And he was saying, like, okay, let's say there was a bunch of, uh, there are men with green beards. So they can see, I am a green beard, you are a green beard. So the traits recognized in others. And the green beards help each other. So this is altruism directed specifically at other green beards. So if the altruism were to be directed specifically at other green beards, then you have that allele effectively self-selecting. So it's giving a benefit because it recognizes a, an RG. So it gives a B because there is an RG. And it may incur a C, but knowing the RG of another, even a stranger who just happens to have the same allele, is going to actually move that into the population. So the natural selection for a gene or an, either an allele for altruism would work as long as it could be perceived and help given to those who it's perceived. And this is really kind of one of those, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, more like you have the gene that would cause you to scratch my back were our situation switched, I'll help you. It's not a purist altruism because you recognize the RG. But it gets more complicated. Oh, it gets more complicated. Simpson's paradox. I don't need you to remember that for this class. Simpson's paradox is really a vehicle level. And this is where I say when I say the full math. So every individual that is altruistic has lower fitness. They incur to see. They incur a C, they have lower fitness. So to be altruistic is to be lower fitness. So the individual may have a lower fitness. But if a society made of those individuals has more altruists than the whole society has a higher fitness. If you take, there's actually an experiment done <laughs> we get much more in depth in a different class where there were some bacteria that secrete an antitoxin. And this is a cost to themselves, but a benefit to the group. Now, left alone, they would not have as high fitness as bacteria that do not secrete the antitoxin. Um, but groups of them together, the gr whole group gets a better benefit of fitness. This is Simpson's paradox. The individual incurs a cost, but the group, if made of similar individuals, incurs a benefit. So the societies that exhibit this variation can mean that some societies will have benefits than, uh, more than others. And honestly, the fact that I'm filming this is in America is kind of one of these examples. So in Japan and in South Korea, when COVID-19 hit, the individuals all began wearing face masks. Now you'll remember, face masks are to, um, it incurs a cost on yourself. They're freaking uncomfortable. That's why I'm just wearing them right now. Um, small cost, 
but incurring small benefit to others. You might not die if I don't if I get sick. It's an altruistic act. Now, in some societies like South Korea and Japan, that altruistic act is something that happens in that society. In other ones, like specifically America, the altruistic act is simply not acceptable. We are made of a society that doesn't want to do it. And what happens is the whole society um, incurs a cost. Uh, when I'm filming this, there are over 150,000 deaths. And the second wave may or may not exist. You know I don't. Or you might know in a week or two I don't. But the idea is a society that is altruistic has a higher chance of survival than one that doesn't. Hard words for America right now. So selection is acting on the gene, and it's the group with the gene. So there is a whole um, altruistic side to this, and <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of math. Why don't you take evolution next semester? It gets, uh, it gets a lot more interesting. We go a lot more in depth. So that's altruism, social and use social creatures. And yeah, they get more rats. See you next lecture.